Um, so I think we're going to go ahead and get started because I want to make sure we have as much time as possible to kind of get into the working session part of this. Um, so welcome to all of you from the Planetary Health Alliance team, and thank you for being here and pushing through what I'm sure is for many of us an excellent midday slump. Um, we will be writing and talking and chatting in this session, so we hope that it's pretty exciting. So this is the FAM 2022 Next Generation Network Convening, uh, and the topic of our session today is activating and connecting youth networks to grow the next generation community. Um, I think I've met most of you, but as a refresher, I'm Joanna, I'm the Community Building and Outreach Coordinator, and I'm the PHA's uh, team lead for the Next Gen Network slash PHCA program, and I'll explain more why I phrased it just now the way that I did. So this is our agenda for today, um, and welcome to everyone who's joining us virtually, including many of our fantastic ambassadors who weren't able to be with us here today in person. Um, we miss you, and thank you for hanging in there as the group chat blows up. Um, welcome and presentation from the PHA is how we'll start, which is what we're doing right now. Um, next, we're going to hear from Omnia El Omrani, who's on our Zoom with us. Uh, to speak to us about movement building um, and kind of being a youth leader in youth leadership. Um, we're going to hear from Kelsey Worth, who will address us live in person, uh, who is um, working at the front of Mothers Out Front. And then we will jump right into a working session for uh, a, the vast majority of this uh, meeting. That, is work, that working session is why you have paper, post-its, pens on your table. I'll explain what we'd love for you to do with them. Um, but this working session is really gonna focus on you talking amongst yourself, brainstorming, blue sky picture. What does a planetary health youth network look like? What are the priorities? Uh, what's the capacity that we have to build such a network and what are the needs that it should be meeting? And then we're going to report back. Um, so we're going to have one person from each breakout group come up here to the mic uh, and list what the three main takeaways your group identified were. And those three main takeaways are what we'd love for you to write down somewhere in big letters on these sheets because we're going to be collecting these sheets and using them to inform uh, the strategy behind building out further the Next Generation Network. Um, you can also put those in a corner, doodle, brainstorm, anything you want with these papers, but we would like to keep them. So uh, keep that in mind. Um, so I want to start by talking a little bit about the status uh, of the Next Generation Network as it currently stands. So for those of you who don't know exactly what I'm talking about when I say, ne say Next Gen Network, it's the component of PHA-led programming and the community that we've tried to build for youth leaders within planetary health. Um, it originated, well, currently, main components of the Next Gen Network uh, are the Planetary Health Campus Ambassador Program, as well as resources that we offer to student clubs, um, and more broadly, the fact that 125 of our members are universities or uni university-based institutions. So that kind of sets the stage for the scale of the youth network that we have access to, thinking of how many students are at these universities collectively, uh, that alone is a massive network that we really want to tap into and mobilize um, kind of along the topics of what we're talking about today and what we're all already so aware of by nature of being here at this meeting. Um, the Campus Ambassador Program originated in 2019 and yearly cohorts have grown from uh, six ambassadors in 2019 when it was at the pilot program to an annual average of about 50. Um, and for the last two years, we've routinely needed to turn away more than 50% of our applicants due to capacity. So that alone paints a picture of um, where, how much energy there is and how much, how critical it is that we figure out really how to kind of tap in and to that energy and offer uh, a, a network th that they can engage with and feel like they're a part of. Um, I do want to talk and focus for a sec on the evolution of the Campus Ambassador Program in more detail because at the moment, the Campus Ambassador Program is probably 80% of what the Next Generation Network is. Um, 
And there's a reason for that. You've heard us talk a lot in these past two meetings here in the Rotunda, and you'll hear it probably come up throughout the course of the week about just capacity and wanting to make sure that we're doing something that's meaningful and building something that's meaningful. And building a meaningful campus ambassador program has taken most of the capacity that we have in terms of when we talk about next gen work. So the program itself, we're incredibly proud of. Um, I'm just curious, could you stand up if you are a current or former campus ambassador? Yeah. <laughs> so our ambassadors are fantastic and they come from around the world and they represent almost every level of um, collegiate and above education and the work that we have uh, been doing over the past four years is designed to really make sure that we're offering meaningful opportunities for these ambassadors to grow into planetary health youth leaders and next-gen leaders and they have done so. They have, uh, from as you can see the stats here are, kind of speak for themselves. From 2020 we had 39 ambassadors, 16 countries represented, 31 universities represented. 22, 58 ambassadors representing 28 countries and 46 universities. And this year we have 54 ambassadors representing 19 countries and 34 universities. Um, and the energy behind the program, I think this is the year we've finally stopped referring to it as a pilot program and admitted that it's kind of able to run pretty smoothly now. It's um, built out and we are so excited and proud of the work that we see coming out of this element of our next gen network. Um, including a lot of these notable projects um, down below. Uh, and we're ready to build beyond it. Um, so it is a functional, it is, it, is a, it is a foundational piece of the Next Gen Network, but we do want to kind of really shift focus now in terms of how we as the core team take this kind of additional capacity that we've come into as our team has grown and the Campus Ambassador program has really come into its own and address this goal of building out a youth network that's capable of facilitating movement building. Um, the energy that we feel from the youth community is immense and palpable and we wanna make sure we're listening to what exactly that energy is asking for and providing it and equipping this huge portion of our community with whatever tools uh, that they need to um, as the slide says, really facilitate movement building uh, because we think that this portion of our community is, has, is able to do so. Um, so the vision, kind of what I just said, build a network and understand how to best utilize it. Um, the network can foster professional connections. It can build capacity around movement building. It can, it can include a regional youth leadership component. These are all things that we would very much like to see, but we wanna make sure that that aligns with your vision for a youth network as the planetary health youth leaders in our community here with us today. Um, one thing we would like to really prioritize is to make sure no matter what we do and no matter how, what next steps come out of this meeting, we come out of this next meeting with, that we're collaborating with existing youth networks and existing youth opportunities to build this network of network networks, not reinventing any wheels or duplicating capacity. Um, and we wanna hear what else. So um, with that, um, I'm going to turn the floor over to Omnia El Omrani. Uh, Omnia is the COP27 President Envoy on Youth. Uh, gonna go ahead and just read your bio for you all in case anyone forgot their glasses today. I did. Um, Omnia is the first official youth envoy for the COP27 president and a plastic commissioner uh, at the Lancet Chatham Population Health, a youth, you know what, I'm so sorry, I actually did forget my glasses, so I'm just gonna let you guys read that. <laughs> um, that's really embarrassing. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and turn the floor over to Omnia and uh, yeah, Omnia, are you here with us? Um, so hello everyone, I'm so happy. To, yes. Uh, yeah, so hello everyone, I'm so happy to be uh, with you today. Um, and uh, I wish I was there in person, but it's also amazing to see uh, such incredible youth, uh, climate and planetary health advocates 
and uh, I'm always so inspired by the work of PHA, as well as the work of the student ambassadors, uh, leading one of the key advocacy is that we need for planetary health. Um, so yeah, I've been working for the past six years on the area of planetary health and climate change. I started when I was a second year medical student, and then I joined the International Federation of Medical Students Association, the IFMC, which is also uh, it gave me the incredible opportunity to learn about climate change uh, and get inspired from other students globally um, around that specific area. And um, I truly believe that as medical students, we are also the future healthcare uh, health workforce, and we will be at the front line of all the detrimental health impacts that we are seeing led by climate change uh, in, a, in the disproportionate and unjust way that it is. Uh, the, recently, the Lancet countdown report was just released uh, around three days ago, and the numbers were very um, catastrophic when it comes to how many people lost their lives because of extreme uh, weather events such as heat waves, how many people had a uh, lack of access to food and, uh, and faced acute water insecurity. But at the same time, and this is one thing that I started to work on with my own organization, which is um, we as the health workforce and the future doctors, we do not learn about that specific issue, planetary health or climate change in our own curricula and our own core education. And that is why uh, in 2020, we did a survey to ask all the students in 112 countries to reflect on the curriculum of their own universities. And we asked them a simple question, which is, is climate change mentioned in your own curriculum or not? And if yes, is it consistent? And do you have any student-led activities related to climate change? We discovered in over 2,817 schools, less than 15% mentioned climate change, and it was very inconsistent and this really helped us um, drive the urgency of integrating planetary health and climate change into our own education to build the capacity of the future health workforce to be able to cope and be resilient uh, in the face of the impacts of climate change, which is part of the broader adaptation agenda, but at the same time to also be environmentally conscious and responsible by mitigating the healthcare system and uh, working towards low carbon, environment friendly healthcare facilities, leading by example across all the sectors. And because of that survey, we had the opportunity to work with diverse educators, deans, and on behalf of the Association of Medical Education Europe, AMI, we developed a consensus statement to call on all deans, universities to integrate planetary health into education, which is the planetary health education consensus statement that I would love. Uh, and I would share it with you to check it out. And at the same time, this really helped me personally in my own university, which is Ain Shams in Cairo. And we became the first ever university to make climate change in Egypt a mandatory course, and not just in the faculty of medicine, but across all the faculties in the universities. Of course, we had the opportunity because Egypt was also the host of COP27 to see a diversity of universities mobilizing for climate change integration. But it really showed that more countries are now listening, more deans are now listening. And it's important that our role as students is equal, natural, and imperative to drive curricular change and planetary health advocacy in our own education, but also in our own uh, communities. Um, I'm also very lucky to share with you that um, this is the first time ever that there is an envoy for young people for the COP presidency, which is the biggest global forum around climate change advocacy. And um, one of the most uh, powerful messaging that now with the team we're bringing in is the importance of health in the climate change and the broader uh, environmental context across all the negotiations and the policy making. And we cannot do this on our own at COP. And it's not just about COP, it's about your countries and really mobilizing a powerful health argument for planetary health and climate action because we do not have any time 
this year we say that COP, which is five days away, is the implementation COP. And I think now is not the time for negotiations. It's time for the implementation and action on the ground. And we, as the planetary health community, bring in the evidence and the solutions to make sure that our nations and country leaders do not backtrack on their promises, but instead work together with us to protect the health of our people and our planet on which life depends on. So your work is so fundamental to driving that urgency that is needed for the health of the current and the future generations to come, because we don't want to look at our um, children and our grandchildren and say that we had the opportunity to advocate for planetary health, but we did not progress enough and you need to do that. We would like to really have this handled and led from our side so that they do not and they would not need to worry about the health of our planet. So again, I'm so grateful and so uh, lucky to be with you today and to witness the incredible work that I know you've been leading for all, all year long um, and also the work of PHA and uh, hope to see many of you at COP, but if not, we also have a, w, a health pavilion at COP that focuses on climate change and health, the WHO pavilion. All the sessions will be streamed online. So even if you were not able to make it in person, you can still make it virtually. I also share with you a toolkit that I developed with my team that has all the list of uh, pavilions and events that you can attend virtually, but also all the uh, necessary information you would need to engage in at COP and the climate uh, negotiations and processes. Best of luck and looking forward to any of your questions. Thank you, Omnia. So I think we have time actually for five minutes of Q&A for Omnia before we go into our next uh, presentation. Um, and I'm gonna have anyone who has a question just come up to the mic. Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Um, okay, perfect. So hi, I'm Angela. Um, I'm uh, like a student in undergraduate studies and I will be attending COP, so hopefully we'd love to meet you. Um, as the first official youth envoy, I was curious as to what sorts of steps or precedents you would set in to ensure that youth are represented via envoys and other capacities at future COPs and at the negotiation table in general for climate action. Yes, thank you so much for your question. And I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing you very soon in Sharm. Um, in regards to your question, I think this COP, one of the main priorities we have as the Egyptian presidency is that we wanted to transform the role and the engagement of youth at COP to be meaningful and sustainable and to break the silos between the negotiators, heads of delegations and the youth representatives. And how are we planning to do that? Our, the, the efforts that we did to uh, facilitate this. The first is that, as you know, right before COP, there's the Conference of Youth, COI, where over 1,000 young people come from around the world. Uh, and it's starting after tomorrow from the 2nd to the 4th. This COI produ produces a global youth statement, which is the main youth input to the negotiation process. And the consultations were done over the past three months for youth virtually. And now it's going to be uh, with young people in Sharm el-Sheikh. And every year, the, the global youth statement is presented to the COP president to you know, adopt it in a way, but it was, it was never very clear. This time in Egypt, we want to change that. We are going to utilize the global youth statement and organize two roundtable discussions between negotiators and young representatives on the Youth Day, which is November 10th. And in these roundtable discussions, young people will get the opportunity to share their inputs as well as co-create policy recommendations together with the negotiators and really have an engaging and mainstream their inputs in an intergenerational dialogue and not a final discussion, but more of a round table back and forth, uh, open and inclusive way for young people to engage directly with the negotiators. The second thing I'm so happy to share is the youth pavilion for the first time ever at COP. There is a children and youth pavilion, which is a youth led dedicated space for two weeks filled with youth led uh, events 
dialogues and workshops where we as young people are inviting the policymakers, including the negotiators, ministers, to come to our events and discuss together uh, inputs as well as key recommendations for uh, the uh, climate negotiations. As you know that last year in Glasgow Climate Pact, there were two articles, one which is focusing on the intergenerational dialogues that we are implementing on November 10th. Also on November 10th, we have the first uh, session that focuses on children and adolescent voices together with ministers and experts to discuss how climate education is important, as well as climate change as a child rights crisis. And the second article in the Glasgow Climate Pact, which is Article 65, looked at the representation of youth in national country delegations. And this year I'm organizing for the first time a gathering of all the young negotiators to share their experience on how did they get there and how young uh, delegates and young youth experts like themselves get the opportunity to go on behalf of their countries, organize their own delegate programs, as well as uh, go with the official country delegations uh, going to COP. So these are a few examples of what we're doing. And another thing that I've been doing with the Egyptian Ministry of Youth, which is a platform to showcase the work of youth, to demonstrate that we as young people have our voices and demands, but at the same time, we also have our solutions that we need you to partner up with us and implement it together with us with the support that we need in terms of finance as well as technical expertise. And also, I'm already working together with the next youth envoy for COP28, who will also be present at COP. So to ensure that there is a sustainability in terms of the youth envoy position uh, as a link between young people's needs, demands and solutions and the presidency team for COP. Thank you so much, Omnia. Uh, and I know we're kind of over time for you, so thank you so much for staying on and chatting with us. Uh, anyone else who has questions for Omnia, please jot them down and I will connect you two over email. So don't forget them. Um, all right, our next speaker uh, is here with us live. Um, Brings me great pleasure to introduce Kelsey Wirth. Sorry, Kelsey Worth from Mothers Out Front. Um, Kelsey is the co-founder and former president of Align Technology, which is the maker of Invisalign. She has served on the boards of the Environmental Working Group and Grist Magazine, and is president of the Winslow Foundation. Uh, she is a native of both Washington and Colorado, uh, and graduated from Harvard College, getting her MBA from Stanford University. She lives here in Massachusetts with her husband Sam. Uh, and their two lovely daughters, Sophie and Lucy. So, Kelsey, welcome. Uh, thank you, Joanna. Um, it's uh, the only relevant parts of that bio, by the way, um, are that I'm married to Sam Myers, who most of you know, and that I am the mother of Sophie and Lucy. So, uh, the rest of it, please ignore. Um, so it's really a pleasure to be here with all of you and, and wonderful to see um, the youth leaders in the room and to hear from Omnia virtually um, because you are, of course, the leaders of the future and you are the people who we all need to be investing in and you're going to be leading the change that, that um, our planet needs and that, that all life on Earth needs. So um, thank you for all of your leadership. I think, I think Joanna wanted me to talk today a little bit about my experience with movement building and specifically with Mothers Out Front, which is an organization I co-founded uh, nearly 10 years ago now. Um, and to think maybe a little bit about what is the relevance of my experience organizing moms here in the US to the work that you're hoping to do with youth uh, in this country, but of course all around the world. Um, so I don't know necessarily what the relevance will be. I think we can maybe pick some uh, basic principles out and then, you know, I would actually want to hear from you as to what you think the relevance might be because you're the ones who are out there doing this work. Um, so Mothers Out Front is focused on really building an organized constituency of moms in the U.S., moms from all backgrounds. And the origin um, was 
my becoming a mom and for the first time viewing the climate crisis through the lens of being a mom whose number one job it is to protect my children. Um, and feeling overwhelmed by fears, a sense of despair um, about the future that my two daughters would be facing. Um, and, and of course, having my own hopes and dreams for them too. Um, so I wanted so badly to protect them from, from what we all know is, um, is happening around the world. Um, and yet I felt completely powerless to do anything, right? I wasn't a scientist or um, a physician or healthcare professional, um, not an elected official. I was literally just a mom. Uh, and it was very clear that unlike what a lot of people in this country are told, and I think too many still believe, no number of individual actions that I took as a mom was gonna make any difference, right? I mean, the, the scale and the urgency of the problem is so enormous, so driving an electric car, that's really nice, but that's not gonna address the climate crisis. And so I, there I was feeling desperate to do something, and I thought, I couldn't be the only mom that had these feelings. And so I set out to find other moms who had similar concerns um, for their children and the future they were facing in the face of the climate crisis. Um, so I, was, I learned about organizing from a man named Marshall Gans, who's at the Harvard Kennedy School, and um, I had read about his work uh, playing a role in the Obama presidential campaign and I tracked him down and I said, I want to learn from you about what you do. Um, and he taught me some sort of basic principles. Um, one is that uh, people coming together out of, a sh out of a sense of shared values and a sense of outrage at the way the world works and a desire to change that, they are, that is the only thing that has ever driven transformational change in this country. So from women's rights to civil rights to uh, reproductive rights to same-sex marriage, it has always been an organized movement of individuals who that through collective action can stand up to powerful vested interests. So my challenge was to figure out how to do that with moms. Um, so we started very much at the local level here in Massachusetts because that's where I lived. We started hosting house parties where we brought moms together and we would talk to them about climate change, its causes and its consequences. We would talk about what we might all do together if we actually joined forces as moms. Um, and we uh, talked about how we would grow our movement. Um, from there, after having lots of house parties in the, in the greater Boston area and then more across the state of Massachusetts, uh, we started forming teams, so community-based teams of moms to make it easier for moms to come together and strategize and decide what they wanted to do together. And those teams of moms are the teams, that's the structure we use to drive campaigns for change, so for political change. Um, we recognize at Mothers Out Front that climate change and so many of these planetary health challenges is fundamentally a pol an issue of, um, of politics. It's a political power problem. And there is an industry, the fossil fuel industry, that has spent billions of dollars over decades to lie and deceive us and to spread disinformation and lobby elected officials and all of these things that we know. And the question is, how do you stand up to an established set of a power structure like that and actually create change? Our response to that was to build the power of moms by coming together. So we started in Massachusetts. Um, we have had a number of different successful campaigns starting at the local level, so establishing our power base at the local level and then driving statewide campaigns as well. Um, and then we have spread our work to four other states across the country. And the kinds of campaigns that our moms work on are things like stopping new fossil fuel infrastructure projects like power plants, pipelines, compressor stations. Uh, we've worked to convince cities to switch their electricity from dirty to clean electricity. 
Uh, we've worked to get new air quality monitoring devices into the hardest hit communities to make sure that the pollution levels are being accurately measured so that then smart policies can be created based on that. Um, we have moms working on electric school bus campaigns so that their children are no longer going to school uh, and breathing toxic diesel fumes. So the list of campaigns that we work on goes on and on. Um, and our moms are empowered uh, through training and coaching to strategize together to decide what it is they want to work on and then wage these campaigns for change. Um, so we are 10 years in now, um, been through a global pandemic that was particularly hard on moms <laughs> uh, with a lot of children at home and taking care of sick family, obviously. We've emerged from the other side um, and are continuing to grow. Our base is about 38,000 strong in this country. We plan to triple our size over the course of the next three years and then continue growing from there. Um, fundamentally, our belief is that moms um, have, a, have a vital role to play in pushing for the kind of world and creating the kind of world that we want for our children. Um, and it is always the young people that are at the vanguard of social movements across this country and around the world historically has always been the case. Uh, but as moms, we know we can't leave it up to just the youth and that we have a vital responsibility to do what we can to make sure that you have um, a healthy planet. Um, so those are some thoughts. And I guess um, I would pose a few um, questions to think about among this group, um, which are questions we thought about at Mothers Out Front. W one is sort of starting with who are my people? Um, so who are, you, who are you trying to organize? What is your power base potentially? Uh, for us, it's moms, obviously. It started out as moms in Massachusetts, started out as moms in Massachusetts who kind of look like me because those were the networks we started with. We have expanded significantly beyond that. We are in, engaging moms in different states across the country and from all different backgrounds at this point. But starting with that fundamental question is, I think, incredibly important. Um, another thing to be thinking about is how do you build power? So fundamentally, movement building is about building power. It's the power of people coming together. So individually, you don't have a lot of power, but when you come together and act collectively, you have significant power. So how do you go about building power among your people? Um, another thing to be thinking about is what kind of a structure do you create? It's kind of the most boring part of it that people don't, you know, no one wants to think about structure. And yet, if you don't have a structure, you cannot sustain the movement that you're trying to grow. So what does it look like? Is it teams? What kind of relationship-based teams can you create that are able to strategize together to move things forward? So I think that's another key question. And I would encourage you to think a lot about what is the difference between a network and a movement? So you can have a network of people working on all kinds of, you know, their own projects all over the place but are they really building power together? Um, and, um, and again, coming back to just the extraordinary opportunity that you all have with young people, healthcare professionals, that combination with the incredible passion and drive um, and energy that young people bring to these issues, I think world, you know, sky's the limit in terms of what you could actually um, achieve as a group. So I'm happy to answer any questions, and I thank you. Well, I certainly don't have any answers per se, um, and I'd be really curious to hear what other people in the room have to say. Um, but, you know, a lot of this does come down to leadership and it comes down to sort of and strategy and what you decide to do together. But having having a a, a smaller group to whom you delegate the, the authority to be thinking about some of these decisions um, and figuring out how that works. So it's it's some sort of a representative decision making body that is again sort of given um, the opportunity to think about 
your structure and how you grow. That I mean, that's one idea. But I, I would ask all of you. You're the ones doing this work. I have no idea what the different kind of areas of work that you've been involved in are or the kind of structure. Really, I don't know enough about the structure that exists so far. So um, that's not necessarily a great answer, but that's what I got for now. Um, that's a really good question. So um, we started really small. We started by having one-on-one -on -one conversations with people we knew who we thought maybe might be interested in getting involved. So it started very small. But then we started very quickly bringing people together in small groups, having what we called house parties. And we had a lot, a lot, a lot of house parties. I mean, we've had hundred, hundreds, maybe thousands of house parties at this point, where we bring mothers together and we invite people to come. Not everybody who comes ends up being interested in what we're doing, but by, through the course of um, allowing them to engage in the topic and to understand what Mothers Out, Out Front is about, they sort of decide for themselves as to whether they want to be a part of this. So that's a big part of it. And then, of course, there's digital technology, right? So there's an online organizing aspect to this that, that is, helps. It's not a substitute for the in-person organizing from our standpoint, but it does help to reach more people, so to operate actually at a larger scale. So you learn how to send, uh, you might send, for example, a letter out that you want people to sign that goes to their city council, and then if 100 people sign on to that letter, then you sort of you think, well, maybe some of those people will want to get more involved in Mothers Out Front and form a team and go up what we call the ladder of engagement. So, um, so we come at it from a few different angles. The house parties is, the, is a very um, labor-intensive, relationally intense uh, part of it and is, is absolutely key. Um, and we use digital, digital organizing as well to bring people into sort of a large funnel and then we assume that's gonna narrow down and through a series of um, action opportunities, they demonstrate how interested they are and then we invite them to be part of a team. So a couple different ways. Does that answer your question? Okay. And thank you for all those questions because it cued me up so perfectly for uh, what we are all about to do together. So for the next 30 minutes, we're going to go into the working session portion of this meeting, um, which is why at each of your tables you have paper, pens, post-its, um, because we really want to hear from you about the structure and the network and how you guys think we should tackle the need to build what Kelsey so accurately described as the boring but necessary capacity portion of uh, a network that would enable us to tap into the energy that I think everyone in this room feels. Um, we want to facilitate planetary health movement building and we want to have a really good answer to the students and the young, then the youth leaders who reach out to us individually and email the PHA inbox cold and say, I'm a, I'm a student and I'm frustrated or angry or scared or motivated and I want to tackle planetary health and how can I? So we want to have an answer to that question. Um, and that's kind of what we hope to kind of crack the nut on today. Um, I do just want to call out something I heard in a previous session, not to put you on the spot, Emmanuel, wherever you are, but Emmanuel in the member meeting earlier talked about that feeling intimidated as a youth leader sometimes, or feeling, and you know, Kelsey talked about just a mother, you know, the feeling like individual action is n not enough. And that's something that I think is rampant through being a young professional and looking at the scale of the problem and what the community looks like in terms of how, you know, where everyone is in their academic and professional careers. So I want to ask that in this session, you try and put that aside and, understand, and know that right now, these papers that you daydream on, you know, blue sky thinking, if there were no constraints, if you were just, if the, if the network that you wanted existed, 
What does it look like and what does it offer? Um, so that's what we want to hear today um, because we want to try and make that network real. So some guiding discussion questions. What does a planetary health youth network look like? What should the priorities be? What needs must be met? What other youth networks should we be connecting with? Or youth networks, opportunities, programs? Um, I'm gonna put a QR code up on the screen that's uh, just an open Google form. So if you have ongoing thinking, notes, personal input, um, please submit it through the form. Uh, also feel free to write it on the paper, but what we'd love to have by the end of this working session is if every table could have kind of the three big takeaways, you know, the things you agreed on, or maybe even the things that you really didn't agree on that you think we need to talk about a lot more in uh, response to any of these questions, um, and we'll report back on those next steps. Um, so, yeah. With that, I'm gonna send us into our working session, and everyone online, I'm gonna send you into breakout rooms to do the same thing, and I'll give you a Google Doc through which to do so. Uh, but this is the QR code, and again, there's paper per table, but also feel free to kind of circulate amongst the tables if you wanna be a part of a couple different discussions. So, gonna turn it over to, that, to the working session. All right. Who wants to come up here and walk us through what you talked about? One minute. Your table, Marie. And feel free to bring your paper. You can read what's on your paper, and that can be your, your <laughs> feedback. From a table or up here? Uh, from up here, so that our online people can hear. Yeah. All right, everyone. Gloria Blaze again. I promised my table. If I, but if I butcher this, it's... I'm sorry in advance, um, but so we had several ideas, several things came up, um, but one of the first things that we were like, ooh, was having some type of like youth advisory council um, that fits somewhere along the whole structure of the planetary health community, alliance community, and beyond. Um, just having a space for youth that we would perhaps, um, that we would involve in the whole community, having a space for them to have a voice to determine what needs they have and how they see something playing out for them and their peers. Secondly, a critical question that came up was what exactly would we be creating this youth network for? Would it be for, as it, would it be a social movement or would it be more of like a mentorship slash professional development type thing because, um, as Marie said, those two things look completely different and we'd have to definitely be clear on what we're doing so that we can develop a strategy and such. And I'm just gonna call out a couple of other things. Um, we mentioned just partnering with the type of organizations that are representing communities of the youth that would definitely be interested in doing such things. Like, for example, Heather, I'm probably saying your last name wrong, I won't say your last name, uh, but Heather, who is working out of Vancouver, um, mentioned something about 7Gen, which works with, um, is, was it indigenous groups, Heather? Yes, so having a, working with groups like that, and also the 4-H group that is, I think, across several states, um, tries to work with low-income um, groups of, of youth. And um, yeah, and also trying to change the narrative, giving youth an opportunity to change whatever narrative they feel like they need to, to change. And I'm gonna stop there so I don't take too much time, but those were our couple points. All right, who's next? Yes, Angela. Hi again. Um, thank you so much to my table for a great discussion. Um, so I'll first read over the three takeaways and then sort of explain them. So first is the ability to connect meaningfully. So this looks like with mentors, academia, and just making sure that people who are participating do not feel isolated in the space, but rather uplifted and supported. The second is to benefit youth. 
And the third is to create an effective and sustainable bottom-up community-led approach. Um, and so what does this really mean? The first on connecting meaningfully, um, it looks like making sure that all the stakeholders who are part of the process are involved, right? So this looks like administrators, but it also looks like professors, um, people who are your peers who are, have been in the space longer, sharing that type of institutional knowledge with each other and ensuring that it can be passed down. In terms of benefiting youth, I think the climate movement is incredibly fractionalized right now in that there are many youth groups often who are vying to be the face. It's important to ensure that we are actually engaging with the existing youth groups who've been on the ground doing the work, but also individually with youth, making sure that they feel nourished and not burnt out, just because the type of work that is being done is often really rigorous. Um, the people are often very passionate about it, but it uh, also means that they're expected to work very long hours without like financial compensation and things like that. And lastly, in terms of a bottom-up community-led approach, um, often the knowledge that, and that the things that we find most passionate are the things that we find from our local communities, the beauty in the everyday. And so ensuring that we first connect with those who are around us and can take action there, especially because a lot of people who are coming from the Global North to this conference um, can often like characterize the Global South or other like developing areas in certain ways. And we want to make sure that that sort of representation is actually accurate and from the people who are feeling the impacts. Thank you. Who's next? Melvin. Before Melvin comes up, I want to take a moment to recognize Melvin as our amazing Next Generation Network Fellow. I completely forgot to do that at the beginning of the session. <laughs> Melvin has worked with the, with the Next Gen Network for years um, and is such an integral part of, of all that we do with it. So yeah. we're so excited to have you here. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks uh, for being here today. And I'm going to present on behalf of our group. So for us, we discussed that some of the priorities we need to look into is tapping into existing networks, because it starts from the networks that we have for us as a youth to engage more in our, in our actions on activities related to planetary health. And uh, some of the needs is to be having, like, uh, for instance, technical expertise, because uh, we have diversity in, our, in, our, in the youth spaces. And definitely, we need to be passionate about what we do and so on. So we also need to have uh, shared values so that uh, it's easier for us to do or engage in our activities from knowledge into transformative action. And then there is uh, one question that came up uh, uh, is that uh, what could be the role of the university? So we see that uh, as a result of that, it's, it's beneficial if we form like uh, student clubs for sustainability purposes so that in case we have leaders in planetary health, they can leave uh, that opportunity to others once you are done with your like academics uh, in your degrees and so on so that another person can take lead. And therefore, we also need uh, to have mentors as one of the group members had mentioned. And then also there is the issue of power. So like if, if you realize that you are able to take leadership in these spaces, it's important to have a team so that you can be guided through. And then uh, on the issue of uh, working closely with other networks, we talked about uh, engaging the indigenous community, working with religious leaders, and also tapping into other networks, like for instance, Fridays for Future, and also engaging more with other local networks and so on. So that's from our group. Thank you so much. And our last group. Yeah? Hello everyone, uh, my name is Iris. I will summarize for our group. We had great discussions, so I'm sure I won't be able to capture all your amazing input, but I will do my best. Um, first of all, we had a, quite a critical conversation about what is our added value, and this connects to what Melvin just said. Especially in the climate change space, there are amazing youth organizations and youth movements. Um, so how can we add to that um, with this network, and, and what can we bring? Uh, so this 
brings with it the question of are, should we see ourselves as a movement or should we see ourselves as contributing to the movement by shaping a network? Um, and one of the things that we can also think about is this perspective of planetary health, um, which is something that usually is quite missing in the discussions of these existing climate change youth movements. So how can we bring that? And that connects to another point, which is um, Emma had a great idea around should we create something like a campus ambassador program, but then uh, around curricula implementation on planetary health, because this can build the capacity and bring that added value potentially as well to a lot of young people. Um, it also connects to this concept of network of networks, is with, which is what jo network of networks, <laughs> which Joanna introduced in the opening speech, is really creating that bond between existing youth movements organizations um, and, and stimulating potential interaction, especially because we're all doing many, many things when it comes to planetary health and we can prevent to invent the wheel twice while also keeping space for creativity um, and input and new ideas. Um, yeah, and then there's, let me see if I missed anything. Um, oh yeah, and one added um, perspective was also the issue of language, which is not only spoken language, but also language that, uh, how you live your life, um, the way that we communicate our lived experience, um, which is very, very different. And a lot of young people around the world have these different experiences. Um, should we be the ones that connect them all together or should we find those youth organizations and youth movements that are connected to many different youth around the world and are maybe able to better translate what we want or the message that we want them to know or the capacity that we want them to have to their existing uh, youth movements. So those were kind of some of the questions um, that we talked about. Did I miss anything crucial? Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you all. to underscore how incredible youth leaders can be when they put their mind to it, we are exactly on time, which is astounding. So um, I am gonna close this out. Um, this is not the end of this discussion. It's very actively the beginning and we're excited to continue it. Um, so there are a series of ways through which to do so. First, uh, many of you are aware of Hilo. I heard Hilo come up in conversation, and we're aware, but I am going to plug Hilo um, as the current online community uh, network, community building platform uh, for the PHA. So instructions on how to join Hilo if you're not already present on it are on our website, and they'll go out in FAM follow-up as well. Um, again, also gonna plug the member community call uh, happening on December 5th, for 12 p.m. Eastern and December 6th at 9 a.m. Eastern. Um, and then float the idea of a working group formation. So this is not a fully baked idea, um, but in terms of creating you know, a body, a decision-making body that can kind of forward these conversations we're having today, we want to at least gauge interest in being a part of a uh, hypothetical said body. So if you would have any interest in participating in a next-gen network working group operating on kind of a deliverable-based, timeline-based um, methodology, uh, email pha at harvard.edu or indicate so in the Google form. It's one of the, the questions. Or you can email me directly if we're already in contact, which many of us are. So thank you. Um, the last plug I'm going to make is for the New England Aquarium Social Gathering, which is happening in about an hour and a half. Uh, we hope to see many of you all there. It's going to be great. It's at the aquarium. The, the, the fish are out, that was, we got that question. The, the fish are there, um, so all the animals are there, uh, and we'll have some food and drink for you. So it'll be a great way to kind of close out day one. And thank you all for coming. <laughs>